Who am I seeing? Okay, this is ECE 320A. And we are here to try to help you do even better on exam number one. That's the idea. And to get us started, what I, uh, there's all sorts of ways I guess I could do this, but let me just sort of talk briefly about the topics and how they relate and how you need to be thinking about the material for this class. You need to definitely be able to think in terms of a, one, a single phase equivalent sketch and how do you get there. If you just have a single phase system, that's really what you're dealing with, but if you have a three phase system, then you need to make sure that you are comfortable transforming, transforming many different things. You need to be able to transform powers or between the different ones if you're now doing something three phase. By that I'm meaning you might have average or real power given, whoops, or you might have something that's reactive given. You might have both of those. If you're given both of those, then you have the complex power of that particular piece or that load or subsystem. You also may be just given the magnitude of your complex power, which is the apparent power, and that's the product of your voltage amplitude and your current amplitude expressed in RMS units. So you need to be able to think about all of these and how power factor plays into that. And also, if you're transforming powers, how do you transform powers between the total power in a three-phase system and maybe a per-phase power? So you need to understand how all of these relate, and I hope that you're starting to get comfortable simply drawing this triangle meaning here is your P, here's your Q, and then here is S if you had the length and the angle. If you just have the length, then that's the apparent power, and all of these relate to these different powers, and you may only be given a few of these. You may be given the real power and the power factor and be asked to work from that or deal with that. In terms of transforming, you also need to be able to transform between or with, let's say, voltages and currents. Meaning, with these two, you need to, if somebody gives you a maximum value, can you convert that to an RMS value? That's sort of transforming the voltage or the current. You also need to be able to work with phasers and they are vector quantities. You now have magnitude and angle or real and imaginary parts of voltages and currents and you need to make sure that you're comfortable playing with those. Also, you need to understand how line voltage, which I was telling some of the students in office hours, that's code. Line voltage is code for transmission line to transmission line voltage. It's across transmission lines. It's not the drop across a transmission line that might just involve only that A phase's transmission line impedance. Line voltage is from one phase transmission line to the second phase transmission line, or from A to B. And I hope that's clear, or you're clear on that. And then this concept of phase that's when you're dealing with some particular quantity. And you say, oh, what's the current through that particular quantity? That would be a phase current. And you should understand how those are related depending on the interconnection structure that you're working with. That's not the only thing you need to be able to transform. But you ought, well, and maybe with respect to voltage and, voltages and currents, you need to, now with phasor quantities or vector quantities, you be, need to understand how to apply KVL and KCL in that environment or with variables that are vector quantities. When you say minus V, 
plus something else, then V is actually a magnitude and an angle, or it's real and imaginary pieces. So all of those need to be understood. The other thing is to worry about transforming impedances. And you can play with all of these with Ohm's law. You have the power formulas that you need to be comfortable with. By that I'm meaning if you looked at the complex power S, that's V phasor I phasor star. But if you replaced V with Ohm's law, ZI, then that gives you this z times i's magnitude squared. Another way of thinking about the complex power. Or if you had the voltage's magnitude across some element and you were interested in the complex power, then you would have this magnitude of your voltage squared divided by the complex impedance of Z. Again, you need to be comfortable deriving those or knowing where they come from and then using those equations because you may just be given a voltage across a load and maybe some part of the complex power. And now you need to understand what do I have or what's being asked in this particular question. And obviously the transformation with impedances that I haven't yet said is know how to go between Y and delta or delta and Y. And when it's balanced, the Y is sort of inside the delta, so it's smaller. And you could think of if you have now a balanced system, your delta impedances are equivalent to three times your Y impedances, or you can now go the other direction by dividing both sides by three. So if you start with deltas and you need Ys to maybe, maybe you're given a Y delta configuration, Y sources and delta loads, maybe you wanna convert those delta impedances to Y so that you now have a Y Y balance system and you can do your single phase equivalent. That's what I'm meaning by all of these ideas or concepts. That's transforming powers. Or, I'm sorry, transforming variables. Powers, voltages, currents, and impedances. You also need to be able to do just single phase power problems. where you might have different loads that are in parallel or series or some weird combination. How do you deal with complex powers? Or maybe I should say combining complex powers. They vectorially, and if you keep the real parts and the imaginary parts separate, you can add them, and you don't really have to worry about, is this in parallel, is this in series? You just play with the powers directly. You don't have to worry about how they are interconnected in your system. Combining complex powers, they add, where that add is sort of in quotes, you can't add different pieces, you can't add apples and oranges, you can only add reals and reactive parts together. But they do simply add. You don't have to worry so much about how they're interconnected. If you're given a single phase and multiple loads, you may need to find the total impedance of that problem or that system. And you might be asked for the power factor of individual loads or the power factor of the total combination of the loads. Then you're looking at how do I combine these impedances. And then it is important 
how they're interconnected, whether they're in parallel or series, et cetera. But you may be able to find those impedance values by working with formulas like this. Now you have a way of relating the complex impedance to the complex power and to the current that's associated with that particular load or the magnitude of that current. You also need to be able to do power factor correction. which means either find the reactance from the capacitor that's needed to do the power factor correction. And it might not be all to nothing. It may not be making the power factor just equal one. Maybe the power factor is right now nominally at 0.7. And I say make it 0.95. You be, need to know how to make that happen when you don't just need to eliminate the reactive part completely. How do you make it partially corrected? Maybe you can't introduce that much reactive power to bring it all the way to one for your power factor. And you need to know how to do that. And, wow, I'm jumping all over the place, but here in this single phase, you need to be able to work with currents and voltages possibly for the individual loads. I hope by this point if I said, oh you have an inductive load, what's the sign of Q for that particular load? That's positive, isn't it? Your line is going up in your triangle. If I now set a capacitive load, now your Q is less than, so maybe you could say something like that, Q great, but really inductive, you don't have it equal, then you could sort of just call it either, <laughs> but it, there's nothing there. If Q was zero, then your power is all real, and you don't really have to worry about it being inductive or capacitive. Then I could ask you something directly or very explicitly with the three-phase system, where you might now need to do a Y delta source transformation. Or I might ask you something like, here's the B phase voltage magnitude and angle. Find, and that's maybe the line voltage. Find the phase current in a Y connected generator in the A phase. So you need to be able to work between A, B, and C, and also around either the A or the positive phase sequence or the negative phase sequence understand how those are different and how they are similar. And we've already talked about this Y delta impedance transformation that you need to be comfortable with. And all of these, in terms of the sources, these obviously depend on positive or negative sequences and whether you're going from line to phase or from phase to line. <clears throat> now, there's, I hope you have a chance before the exam to start working some of the old exams, the practice exams, because I think that will be very important. Let me do a problem that's not from those, but it sort of exercises all of these different ideas in terms of relating things. Was there a question? No? Okay. And this is actually in the textbook, and I may not do the whole thing, but this is problem 20 in chapter 10, and I don't think this was a homework problem. 
here it is. You're given a circuit, and I'll just sort of talk my way through it. You're given the transmission line impedance values. You're told that the resistance is 1 ohm, and the reactive impedance is J2 ohm. So you don't have to know what L is or the frequency is. They're just giving you the reactance value already. Then you're given that this is a load, and they actually label this as V sub L at zero degrees. So they tell you the angle of your voltage across your load. And this is a single phase system. Then they also show you in the diagram that your source has an amplitude of 250, but they don't give you what the phase is. And this is RMS. And they tell you just a little bit more information. They say, suppose that this load absorbs 2,500 volt amperes at a power factor of 0 0.8 lagging. And this is what you're given. This is the problem. So you have a load. You're told something about that load. You're not told anything about its impedance. You're told that the angle on the voltage of that load is zero, but you're not told its amplitude. You're told that at the source side, or the generator side of this circuit is a magnitude of 250 RMS, but we're not going to tell you the phase. And now this is what they want you to find. Well, they want you to really find the two unknowns in this diagram. This magnitude, V sub L, and this angle theta, just from this information that's given. So that's what we want to find. We want to find, and this is part A, I think, V sub L in RMS. That's not the phaser, that's the amplitude. You're given the angle. You're told that's zero degrees. So we just need to worry about finding the amplitude of our load voltage and find that unknown value theta, and that's the angle of our source voltage. Uh, that's not load. Let me. Let me. That's our problem. Now, how do we approach that problem? Or one way of looking at that is first, let's just sort of work with what we were given. And maybe the first question that I would ask is, I need to make sure that I'm seeing what's actually there or what was given to us. What power was specified in this problem? And did we hear all of those? I heard complex. I, ha I heard reactive. Apparent. This is a complex problem, isn't it? Is that a hint? What you need to be keying in on are the units. 
that's sort of their way of coding, encoding the information that they're supplying to you. But in this case, don't make any assumptions as far as what they're giving you. That volt amperes is associated with complex power, isn't it? But they're only giving you a single number. And then they're telling you the power factor of that load. So this is really just the magnitude of the complex power of that load. That's what they're giving. They're giving you the hypotenuse. And with this, they're giving you the angle, aren't they? Indirectly, they're giving you the angle that that hypotenuse is sloped at. Is that clear? So from this information, we should be able to find the entire complex power. But it's not given to you explicitly as the real power and the reactive power. It's giving, given it to you in the hypotenuse at an angle. Pardon? And this is the apparent power. So that hypotenuse is really the apparent power. So that's what I would say. I would say, oh, they're giving me the apparent power, which in terms of visually, what am I seeing? I'm saying, oh, that's this hypotenuse. So that now I can be thinking about this particular length. That's what they've given me, that length. And they've given me, oh, be careful. I get kind of sloppy. That's not the theta that I need to find, is it? So let me label this differently. That's the angle of the load. The theta in the problem that's not subscripted is the angle associated with the source voltage. And this is not that angle. But they, well, now how do I find, so if I'm sort of thinking my way through this, I might now say, can I find P and Q? I'm still struggling. I'm trying to figure out what I do know. How can I work this problem? I need to somehow find this voltage, and there may not be one formula. You don't necessarily need to look all the way through the textbook and say there's got to be a single formula that I can just plug these numbers in and get the answer. Probably not. You may have to sort of move around and find or derive or develop the answer. So don't think that there's necessarily one equation that you can plug these into to get your answer. It's probably not going to be that straightforward. In some cases it is, but in this problem it's not. But we can find P and Q for the load with the given information, and at least that would say something, maybe. We would have P plus J Q sub L we don't know this. Oh, we do know this magnitude. So let's figure out what we can find. If I now say, what is P sub L? Can you find a formula for that? So that's the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle, isn't it? But this cosine of the angle the way that we were given it was the power factor of the load, and that was this 0.8. Or this is now 2,500. The power factor was 0.8, but that's 4 over 5. So really what there, if you're into your geometry, this is now your 4, this is 5. You now have a 3, 4, 5 triangle. <laughs> Because the cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. And you know the length ratios are 4 to 5. That's this 4 fifths. So now you know the ratio of this Q 
to the hypotenuse, it's a three to five ratio. And now you can find, without doing too much calculator work, you can find these P's and Q's for this particular system. Or for this load, not the whole system. This now is 500 times four or 2,000. And what are the units on that? That's watts. And Q sub L Now we have three five hundreds, which is what are the units on Q? That's VARs. And now if you're searching for partial credit, you now know what the complex power is in terms of its component parts. You know it's 2,000 plus J 1500 volt amperes. And now it's given as a complex power, the whole thing. No implicit information here. This is now real plus J reactive volt amperes. Ah, good, are we finished? Now what? what? What are we trying to do? You may have to go back and forth a lot. So now you know what this is in terms of its complex power. Can we find the impedance of the load? What would we need to find the impedance of the load? We'd need to know the magnitude of the current or the magnitude of the voltage, wouldn't we? Do we have either of those? Not yet, do we? Can we use the total impedance? Do we know the total impedance? Don't go. Do you want to just go? Why did I pick this problem? What are we given? We know this guy. What have we not done? So we found one power. But then they tell us the magnitude of our supply. So can we find the power of the line? What's it going to take to find the power in the line? The current. Can we find that current? Yes, if we we could find the current. Well, I don't know. I'm just I'm confused. Let's just write an equation. We can find the angle of the current because of this, can't we? But let's just try to find, let's relabel or add some labeling. Let's just find or say that's I. That current is flowing in every piece, isn't it? It's through the generator or the supply, it's through the transmission line, and it's also through the load. One other way of relating this unknown and this angle is through a KVL equation, isn't it? We can always write KVL, right? Because now we're sort of trying to figure out how to relate all of this. But before we do that, maybe we, if we've now defined this I, and we know S of the load, let's rewrite S of the load, the complex power, in terms of these variables that we have on the board. Meaning. S sub L. We know what it is, but in formula, in terms of the variables that we have on our circuit, that's V sub L bar, isn't it? The whole phase or voltage across the load times what? 
current through the load conjugated, isn't it? But we actually know V sub L, a little bit more information on V sub L. We don't know the magnitude, but we do know the angle. So now we can just assume that's one number. That's not this complex piece because of this angle being zero. This just gives us a scaling of the formula, doesn't it? So that zero being there helps us a little bit. Meaning if we converted this to rectangular form, what would we get? We would get V sub L cosine of zero. Cosine of zero is one. We have V sub L plus J V sub L sine of zero. That's zero, so we have no imaginary part of that voltage. So all we have is the magnitude to really keep track of. And this guy, we don't know what that is. That's unknown, the whole phaser. But this now can be reduced to just V sub L. I don't need to label that as an L because that's the same current everywhere. Is it clear what we have there or what we've done? And we've specialized this to the given information. So don't write this formula down on your crib sheet. It's not correct, is it, other than for this problem, this far into working this problem. This is the correct relationship. The S is equal to V I star. That we can use always. But we can now solve this for I star, can't we? Because we can just divide both sides by V sub L, which is an unknown constant, but it's just a constant. This is now S sub L over V sub L. But we know S sub L, that was 2,000 plus J 1,500 over V sub L. Or if we wanted to, I guess, we could write it, there's the real part of that current, or really the conjugate of the current, plus J 1,500 V sub L. If we could find V sub L, we could find the current. That was the conjugate of our current. What's the current itself? Is that okay? That's our current in terms of the voltage magnitude across our load. This is my favorite sentence tonight, isn't it? Now we can, so now we have one equation in I and V sub L. This is, I was sort of getting ahead of myself before. Another equation involving V sub L and I is KVL. Right? We can write KVL in terms of so now what we need to do is find another equation or maybe I should say find another equation containing I in the magnitude of our voltage. And that we can do with KVL. Meaning if we go back here, we can write KVL for this circuit. It's minus 250, and we need to keep track of that angle at an angle of zero or theta degrees. That current times that transmission line impedance. So 1 plus J2 times I bar plus a real number, V sub L. K 
KVL then is minus 250 at theta degrees plus 1 plus J2 times I bar plus V sub L is equal to zero. Well, we know what I bar is. I bar was this 2000 minus J1500 over V sub L plus V sub L So now I have one equation with two unknowns. But remember, this is a special one equation, isn't it? Because it's complex. Because it's complex, it really is two equations. We have a real part that we have to make it equal, and we have our imaginary part that has to be equal. So we really have two equations with two unknowns. VL is just a number. Theta is just an angle. So now you can pull out, well, maybe to clean this up, how about I multiply by one? I can always multiply by one, but my one is special. It's now VL over VL, basically, or it's really VL on this side times VL on this side, and that will get rid of the VL here. So I can multiply both sides by V sub L, is what I'm saying. If I do that, I now have the following. I have 1 plus J2 times 2000 minus J1500 plus V sub L squared is equal to 250 V sub L at theta degrees. Is that okay? VL is just a constant, that's a magnitude, and theta is an angle. Now we simply multiply two complex numbers together. FOIL, right? If we FOIL with it, I mean, fool with it, whatever. So now we apply FOIL, first, outer, inner, and last, right? Is that how you learned how to multiply quadratics? Maybe. So we have 1 times 2,000. I'll do this all out so that you see where it's coming from. All right, if I'm doing FOIL, what do I do next? The outer. So that's now 1 times minus J1500. Inner is J4000. That sounds like a car or something, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd drive a J4000. Now it's in some KVL equation. Oh, well. And finally, the last two terms, which is J2 minus J1500. We have a minus J squared. That's 1. And we have 2 times 1500. That's FOIL. That's that complex number, two complex numbers multiplied out. We then have V sub L squared is equal to 250 V sub L at an angle of theta degrees. If we clean this up, my real part is 5,000, 2,000 plus 3,000. And my imaginary part on the left is 4,000 less 1,500, or that's now plus J. 2500 
And now I have my two equations sort of hidden in this one equation. But I can just equate my real parts and I can equate my imaginary parts and that will give me my two equations. Meaning if I look at my real part, what does that give me on the left of that equality? What's on the right? Is that right? Or is that correct? That was on the right. The real part on the right better be correct. It's just expanding that angle theta into its real part and its imaginary part. What about the imaginary piece? So I'm not going to worry about the J's because those are going to be all there. And on the right, I have 250 V sub L sine of theta. Is that okay? What? Now what? You know, it's time for a joke. <clears throat> and please don't get offended by this, because I may not say it right. But there was a TV show, it was a reality TV show, Beauty and the Geek, many years ago. <clears throat> All right, they had a contestant from MIT. And he said, oh, yeah, that, don't you know the common joke that goes around at MIT? And they go, no, we don't. They said, yeah. <clears throat> I walk up to somebody that I want to meet, and I go, you must be sign squared. And she goes, what? Well, you have to be sine squared because I'm cosine squared and together we're one. <laughs> we're going to use that to solve this. We're going to use cosine squared plus sine squared as one. Okay? So now you should never forget that identity, right? You already knew it, but now you have a more interesting way of remembering that identity. If I square this equation, both sides, and I square this equation, both sides, I'm going to get this something times sine squared and this something times cosine squared, and I can factor out that something and get one I can get a sine squared plus a cosine squared if I add both equations. Is that making sense? Let me do that. If I now square the real part equation, I now have 5,000 plus V sub L squared is equal to 250 V sub L cosine of theta squared. And if I do the imaginary part, square that, I have 25, whoops, you're going, he's falling asleep, right? Is that better? Now we take the left-hand side of the second equation and square that, and we take the right-hand side and square that. Now I'm wanting to add those side by side. This one, I hope you see there's a cosine squared. Here there's a sine squared, and this, they both share the same coefficient, 250 squared V sub L squared. And that then says that I have 250, so if I wrote that down, I would have 250 V sub L squared times 
our joke. That's what's on the right-hand side if I add both of those formulas. And then on the left-hand side, I now have 5,000 squared plus 2 times 5,000 times V sub L squared. Pardon? Okay, so the question was, what happened to our J, I think, is sort of the way that that was asked. It's still there, but we needed really up here in this guy for that to be true the real parts have to be true and the imaginary parts have to be true meaning we simply have to set the real parts equal to each other on the left side and the right side and that gave us this part then we simply compare all of the terms that have a J multiplying them, and we just have to equate the terms. We don't have to worry about the J. We've already sort of absorbed that into our equality. So the J magically is no longer in this equation that needs to hold. This equation needs to be true in order for this equation that I've highlighted in yellow to be a valid equation or to be a true equation. Is that okay? So I've I've not I don't have to worry now about that J. But that was here when I expanded this angle. I wrote this as the quantity cosine of theta plus J sine of theta. That J and this j I can cancel when I equate those two imaginary parts. And I skip that step. I just went directly to equating those two parts. Is that better? And then I told the joke, which I didn't get much of a response. Needs to be 1030 at night before you start laughing, right? Well, we've got plenty of time three and a half hours. Let's keep going. <clears throat> All right. Is this okay now? No, because I haven't finished, have I? I now need to square V sub L squared. Whoops. So V sub L squared squared is V sub L to the fourth. Oh, brother. Plus that term, right? I can't forget that. I'm adding these two pieces. So I now have to add in. I didn't really give myself enough room. Plus 2,500 squared. that mess. So I basically eliminated the, the thetas now, haven't I? The only unknown now in this equation is V sub L and it's a quadratic squared. It's a fourth order, but it's in terms of V sub L squared, isn't it? So I really have a quadratic in V sub L squared and I know how to solve a quadratic. I only have a constant term, a squared term, I'll pull this over, and a V sub L to the fourth piece. Let me clean this up. So I really am looking at a quadratic in V sub L squared. I have now V sub L to the fourth plus this 2 times 5,000 is 10,000 
and I'm now going to pull over the 250 squared from the right hand side. And finally, I have 5,000 squared plus 2,500 squared, and all of that is equal to zero. If I do the algebra, this ends up being minus 52,500, and this becomes 31.25 million. And I can plug that into my calculator or my quadratic formula and solve for v sub l squared. Because this is a quadratic in v sub l squared. I could say, let me just say x is v sub l squared. I now have x squared plus minus 5250x plus a constant. And I can solve that for x which is simply v sub l squared, I can now say v sub l squared is one of two numbers. And I calculated that before. So that's 602 or 51,897.9. And v sub l was a magnitude, so I don't need to worry about the negative pieces when I take the square roots of these two numbers to find v sub l. I'm going to just get two values for v sub l. Is that okay? I can now take the square root of 602, and I can take the square root of 52,000, and that will be my two different v sub l. So that combination of facts in that problem gives rise to two potential solutions. It wasn't a unique solution. I could now have two different voltages that satisfy the given specifications in that original problem. The square root of 602, 625 is 25, isn't it? If you took the square root of 625, so it should be something a little bit under 25. It's 24.5, let's say 4. And the square root of 52,000 is about 230. You should just know that, right? So this is now 227.8. That's a voltage in RMS. And those are our two possible values for that voltage. Remember what it was. That voltage was the magnitude across the load, which means that in order to give you the same current, I'm sorry, to give you the same complex power, your current has to be quite different in both cases, right? When your voltage is this low, your current has to be really big. And when your voltage is this high on the load, your current's not as big to give you the same complex power. Because we know the complex power is VI star. Are we finished? So the question was, you're given a square, don't you take plus and minus the square root of that? And mathematically you would say yes, but practically VL was just a magnitude, wasn't it? So we always assume that that's just a positive number. So now it's okay to not worry about the negative. Is that, is that acceptable? And that's why I could just take or worry about the positive square root of these v sub l numbers or v sub l squared numbers. We still need to find that angle. 
theta. Really? We were asked, we found V sub L, two different values. We now know what this is. If we scroll down, we'll find that we can actually compute I bar for both of those, can't we? Because our I bar formula just divided by that unknown V sub L. And if we knew I bar, then we could find theta, but we can also find theta from one of these equations. If you work part way through our joke, that one won't be too hard to solve for theta, will it? If we know what V sub L is, now we just have a number equal to the sine of theta. We can do the inverse sine and find two different theta values for the two different V sub L's. And that's what we'll do. So we don't even have to find the current after we use the formula for the current in terms of that unknown V sub L. If we now continue then and say, okay, let me just find those two different values of theta with the low value of the voltage, then we have this 2500 equaling 250 times V sub L times the sine of theta, 2500 divided by 250 is 10. We'll divide 10 by that 24 and a half to get sine of theta. Ten over twenty five is about forty percent, so this is now point four oh seven five. For the small voltage at the load, our angle at the source is 24 degrees. That's what we're saying. With V sub L equal to 20 or 227.8. We now have 2,500 is equal to 250 and again we now have sine of theta is 10 divided by this bigger number. And now our angle is not very big. Although it wasn't asked for, I was sort of curious, what are the currents? Just to make me feel warm and fuzzy. After I've done all of this, I might as well compute the currents, right? What are the different currents? With V sub L being the small, then I bar is this 2000 minus J1500 divided by that V sub L, or 81 and a half minus J. 61.1 or if you find the current in polar form that's now 101.9 at minus 
And that makes sense because that has, what, a cosine of 0.8, doesn't it? That's related to the current through our load. If we now said, well, with the bigger, and that current's pretty big, isn't it? 100 amps, 102 amps. That's pretty good size. With the bigger voltage at the load, then our I bar is obviously reduced. And it's now 8.78 minus J 6.58, or that's 10.97, again at the same angle, minus 36.87. Okay, now we have nine more problems to go. You may not get something quite like that on the exam, but you could, and you need to understand how all of those, so what did you have to do? First thing you had to do was find the complex power when the power was expressed as apparent power at an angle. Then you had to write a KVL equation. And you needed to be able to know that that was a vector relationship. It had two parts to it, a real part and an imaginary part. And those all had to play together in order for you to get the amount of information necessary to solve the problem. Yes? I have a question about an alternative way to solve that problem. Sure, but I was about ready to move on from this problem, but you can, maybe we'll hold that, or I think people are done with that problem or not. But there's probably many different ways to solve that problem, and we can talk maybe offline about that. And now maybe we should look at something else. Is that, is that okay? Unless there's a question about that that was derived or a question in how that was derived. How about, let's see, I have some untitled pages here. Somebody wanted to know about this problem. But I'm kind of debating on whether to go over this one or not. This is, I, this is from this summer's exam number one. Summer 13, problem eight, exam one if you want to find it, and the solutions are all out there. But this is now summer 13, what I did on my summer vacation, taught this class. That was half of my summer. The other half I spent teaching 340. I enjoyed my summer. Okay, what was this? Oh, exam number one. What is this kind of a problem? It's a single phase problem. So now you should be starting to see if you can just get images of these in your head when you're reading these word problems. They're, con they're involved, but maybe you need to just start drawing pictures so that you have something concrete to think about or keep in mind. You might quickly read through this and you go, okay, I have a single phase system. I ne don't need to worry about transforming between line and phase quantities. Everything's the same circuit. Okay, I don't have to worry about this three phase conversion stuff. Positive phase sequence, negative phase sequence, I don't have to worry about it. I have two loads though, and they're connected in parallel. I can now visualize that. Load one absorbs 50 watts at a power factor of 0.9, and what I might be doing if I have enough space, as I might be saying, okay, I have two loads, and it looks sort of like this. They're in parallel. Load one 
is 50 watts. Maybe I shouldn't have said P1. I was going to ask what kind of power that is, but it's the real power. And the power factor... So that particular load is inductive, isn't it? Because the power factor is lagging. Load 2 says that there's an apparent power, and in the book it may have just said a power of 90 volt amps at a power factor of 0.8. So they wouldn't even be as informative as what this question on this exam was. They might just say a power of... 90 volt amperes and you have to infer that that's just the length of the hypotenuse. But here we know now that S sub 2's amplitude is 90 or length and the power factor is 0.8 leading. And now they're telling us the magnitude of the current flowing through load 2 is 1.5 volts, I'm sorry, it's late, 1.5 amps RMS. And now suppose the two loads are supplied through a transmission line having a purely resistive impedance of 10 ohms. Problem 8 says, what is the power factor of the combination of load 1 and load 2? Is it 8.5? Just average those two. If we could only be so lucky, right? We can't do that, can we? What do we do? So now can we find the complex power of both of those? So here's the idea. Let me just talk us through and not solve it completely. Can I just kind of talk us through that? You can find the complex power from this information on load one. You know the real part, you know the angle. You can find the angle and then you can divide that P by 0.9 to get the hypotenuse length. And that hypotenuse is going up, isn't it? Because our Q is positive. And we could then find the value of Q. We now know what S1 is as a complex number. Is that okay? We just drew the triangle for load one. We clear on that. We can do the same thing for load two. But now we're given the hypotenuse, and we know this is one of those three, four, five triangles, isn't it? So we can find the real part and the imaginary part of that second load. P2 is four fifths of 90 kVA, Q2 is three fifths of 90 kVA. Now we know S2. Now what do we do? Pardon? We could find the total complex power if we wanted. Is that what we need to do here? We can do that, can't we? So now we can do the total complex power and once we do that, what do we want from that? Now we just need to find the angle of that total, right? Because that will give us the power factor of the total or the combination of load 1 and load 2. Is that okay? And that's how we could solve problem 8. This is actually a three-problem piece of data. Then there's a problem 9 and a problem 10 all with this information because in this particular problem we didn't need this, did we? And we didn't need this, did
did we? So I may give you more information than you need in some cases. And you have to figure out what's extraneous or when do I need it. Yes. So now the question was when we're adding P's and Q's, when we're minding our P's and Q's, it doesn't matter, does it, whether they're in parallel or series. We just add all the P's algebraically and we add all the Q's algebraically. So if we had some positive Q's and negative Q's, we need to keep track of those signs of the Q's, but we just add those up. It doesn't matter how they're interconnected. So in this case, the fact that they're parallel in this part of the sequence of problems, it really doesn't matter. We can just add S1 plus S2. Yes. And that's because they're powers. That's correct. If we now saw these loads as impedances, and all we had was the impedance information, and somebody said, what's the power factor? We can't just add those impedances. We have to combine them as parallel impedances. So that would be Z1 in parallel with Z2. And those are complex numbers. So you could just take Z1 times Z2 over Z1 plus Z2, find the angle associated with those real and imaginary pieces, and you have your angle that you can use to find the power factor. That's when the combinate or the connection, interconnection structure is important. It's when it's impedance or when you're dealing with voltages or currents. You have to worry about Ohm's law and KVL and KCL vectorially. Other questions on this problem? Let's look at a three-phase problem. And this is the same exam, but problem one. This is now asking us to find the single-phase equivalent diagram for the following three-phase system. Now, the first thing that I might do is I might say, what is this problem asking? Well, if it's wanting a single phase equivalent, why don't I just get myself thinking uh, that might be what the source looks like then I might have some transmission line impedance. So if it says there is no impedance, internal impedance in the generator, then we can say that this is zero, isn't it? But what's zero resistance or zero impedance? That's now a a wire. It's not an open circuit. So that being zero, now I can just replace that with a short circuit. So that now if the problem, and I think in this problem it does say there's no internal impedance in the generator, now we have that short circuit. But this is now what I'm looking to build. I need to find Z sub L Z sub A and my voltage V, a phasor voltage from the given information in the problem. And the first thing that it says, it starts telling me about the generator. And it's a positive phase sequence. So now I know that my generator is this ABC and everything is ABC. You can't connect positive and negative phase sequences. Once you're given a phase sequence, 
you need to play with that phase sequence. So if it's now positive, everything is a positive phase sequence. All of my voltages and currents all obey ABC, ABC, ABC. B is 120 behind A, whatever A starts out being. C is 120 degrees from that, behind. Now we're told we have an apparent power, total apparent power. What is this? Oh, it's providing a total apparent power to the rest of the system of 1050 volt amperes. So now our generators, we have three of those, and they form a balanced three-phase system. They're supplying or delivering an apparent power of 1050. So this could be the power company, for example. It's having to deliver 1050 volt amperes, which is influenced by the real power that's being required and the reactive power. That influences that hypotenuse. But that's now associated with what we're seeing here. So how much are we seeing if we simply labeled this, this is A, this is N, this is N, and this is A. Now we know a little bit more about what's happening at this phase of our generator. We are told that the apparent power of the generator total was 1050. What's each phase's apparent power going to be? We just divide it by 3. So this is now going to be 1050 over 3. Or 350 volt amperes. Then we're told that the reactive power absorbed in each transmission line equals 5 bars. We can't necessarily assume that there's no real power loss in the transmission line. There might be. It's just maybe it wasn't given to us. But that might allow us to find what do we need to do. We need to find this voltage. We need to find this impedance, and we need to find this impedance. I think that's what, did I say that? The system must be expressed in terms of voltage sources and impedances. So you can't just give me a power across that and say, I'm done. I need Z sub A in terms of impedances. I need Z sub L in terms of impedances, and I need that supply or generator voltage in terms of an amplitude and an angle. And there's nothing to keep you from saying, I'm going to call that my reference angle. Possibly. You could just say, oh, I'm going to assign that to be at zero degrees. And I didn't ask for the current. You don't have to keep going. I just want the single phase equivalent. You may have to find some of that information in deriving these impedances, but if you don't, you don't. Is that clear? So what do we do now? We know that the Q of the line was 5 VARs. And the line voltage amplitude at the load terminals is 381 volts. What? The line voltage magnitude at the load terminals is 381 volts. Is that anywhere on this diagram? Pardon? I still didn't hear what you said, but it's not explicitly on this, is it? That's a line voltage. That's a transmission line to transmission line magnitude. 
So that's from like A to B, and B is an on here, but we know how to transfer or transform those relationships, don't we? We can just divide that by the square root of 3 to get V, the magnitude of VAN. Is that okay? And we're told the total real power absorbed by the three-phase load, so that's the total power in all three phases is 900 watts. What do we know about the total power in this phase? It's 300, isn't it? It's that number divided by 3 because this is a balanced system. So now we know P sub A is 300. We now know the voltage dropped across here its amplitude is 381 divided by the square root of 3. Yes? So what we are given is if this is Z sub A, and that's Z sub B, we are told the magnitude of this voltage is 300 and whatever it was, 381 volts. That's from transmission line to transmission line, that amplitude. We need in our single phase equivalent, we just need this voltage from A to N. And it's not going to be half of that because these are balanced three phase, so they're not 180 degrees apart or in line, are they? They're 120 degrees. So that's where this square root of 3 comes from. That's why you have to be a little bit careful, but you need to know, hopefully, this relationship between line voltages and phase voltages, amplitudes. Is that clear? So we would get V sub A N's amplitude by taking this line voltage, which is code for transmission line to transmission line voltage. This is terminal A, terminal B. We divide that by the square root of 3, and that will now be our magnitude of that phase voltage. Okay. And then we can just go from there. <laughs> We're also told the total apparent power of the inductive load. We know the load is now with a Q that's positive. And the total apparent power is 1,000 volt amperes. We now know that the, in this power triangle at the load, we know that the real part is 300. We know the length of the hypotenuse is 333, isn't it? It's 1,000 divided by 3. And now we know the power factor of that load. We also know P, we know the magnitude of the voltage, we could get the current magnitude from our formulas, we know the power factor, so we can get the current magnitude. Once we have the current magnitude, now we can go and find the impedance, the reactive impedance of Z sub L, And then we're almost finished. Once we have I, we can back out this impedance with the voltage and I. But we now can, we, we were told the total power being supplied by the source. We can use that to figure out what the real power in the transmission line is because we have all the powers except for that one power. 
And once we have those powers here, complex powers, we know the magnitude of the current, we can now back out the impedance in that particular transmission line. Yes? So we may or may not, sometimes I may solve these with more steps than are needed, but in this particular case, one way of doing this relationship, you know the magnitude of the voltage, you know this particular complex power, you now have a power equal to, let's say, power of A. One formula for power of A would be V sub A in I sub A A cosine of theta sub A. This is now our power factor, if we wanted it. So if we have that, which we can get from our total impedance, I'm sorry, our total power of Z sub A, then we know this, we know this, that was 381 divided by the square root of 3, we can solve for this amplitude. And once we have that, now we can back out the reactive part of that impedance and we can now find the real power lost in our transmission line because we were told this guy. It's all worked out. Question? So now I want the magnitude and or the angle. If you have the impedance here in the transmission line and the impedance here, you could, if nobody specified the current, you could just go back and make this your reference voltage and say, I'll give you the magnitude and say that's my reference and give it a zero degree for an angle. That's okay. That could be your reference generator voltage. Let me, let me say one more thing about transformations and in particular this load transformation. I derived this on that lecture that was cut off and I had to go on to the Elmo. I derived these formulas, but let me give you a way. If you have these formulas and maybe somebody has given you impedances that aren't labeled the way that your diagram is labeled, let me give you a way of sort of thinking about how to find the impedances. Suppose you want to, maybe you're given the red delta impedances and you want to find the y's. Well, you know the structure. It's the sum of pairwise products in the numerator divided by, so now here's Z1. Actually, we're given the Y's and we want to go to delta, I guess, in this first one, sorry. So we're given the blues, the ZA, the ZB, and the ZC. It's getting late. Huh? <clears throat> 12 hour day so far. I still have more to go. Where was I? Trying to find this delta, Z1. And we're given the Y's. We can now pairwise product these Y impedances and add them up. So we have ZA times ZB plus ZB times ZC plus ZC times ZA divided by, and now I want Z1. Well, I say what impedance is not touching Z1, well, it's Z sub C. That's the one I divide by. That's a way to sort of think it through if they're not labeled the way you want them to be labeled. You just go, oh, I'm going from Y to delta. I take the prod pairwise product and add those up. That's my numerator. And I divide by, if I want this guy, I divide by the impedance that he doesn't touch. If I want this guy, Z sub 2, then I divide by what? ZA. If I want Z sub 3, what do I divide by? ZB. Is that making sense? So those formulas are all the same except for the denominator, and now you know how to kind of pick the denominator. You just say, oh, 
I look for the impedance that's not touching Z1, and I use that one as my denominator. A similar kind of thought process, but it's really just the opposite for going delta to Y. Suppose you're given the reds, and I've tried to color code this. I'll give you these notes, I hope. That'll be another part of my day. I'll try to make this available. Uh, I need to get ready for tomorrow's class sometime. Who sleeps, huh? All right. So now all the denominators are just the sum of the three delta impedances. I sum Z1, Z2, Z3. And then I say, oh, I want this Y. I say, what impedances touch that? It's Z1 times Z3, and that's the product in the numerator. If I now say, oh no, I want Z sub C, what's in the numerator for that? Z3 times Z2. It's those impedances that touch Z sub C. Is that making sense? That's a way to sort of have this diagram, and if it's mislabeled relative to how you've labeled it. You don't have to spend all this time trying to, uh, let's see, which one's the A, which one's the 1, the 2. Just sort of know this strategy for going Y to delta or delta to Y. Does that make sense? I didn't get a chance to talk about that before. And then if it's balanced, The numbers are my deltas. The alphabetical subscripts were my y's. I can start with this one, and I say, okay, one of the deltas, z delta, is all these y's multiplied and summed. So I have now 3zy squared divided by zy. So that's just 3zy. And that is what we've been saying. The y's are inside the delta in my diagram, so they are smaller, and I know they're differing by this factor of 3. So your impedances, when you transform those, if it's balanced, you have this factor of 3. If it's currents and voltages, and you have three phases going on, and you have to convert, what's your factor, scaling factor? square root of 3, isn't it? Because they are 120 degrees apart, that's why you get that square root of 3 and not this factor of 3 or not this factor of 1 half or just adding and subtracting. That's why where that factor comes from. That's probably enough, huh? I do have office hours tomorrow. What's tomorrow? Wednesday? But I do have to stop those at 3.45 because I have a class at 4. Yeah, who cares about that graduate class? This is being recorded. I really care about that graduate class. And I have office hours Thursday morning if you need last minute questions. Good luck. I think there's plenty of material to get you ready, but hopefully you're getting there.